Okay. Are we recording right now? We are recording right now. Holy, Holy smoke. smoke. So thank you. Thank you for doing this. All right, thank you're you welcome. For, thank you for talking okay. to me. We're recording right now. I here. know that you um, spent time as a child in a World War II internment camp. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. Yeah. That's, um, that's easier to talk about. Uh, it was painful, of course. But it was also, I was young and it was in certain respects exhilarating because I consider that a triumph of, of the will. You mm -hmm. know. You know who first said that was Lenny Riefenstahl for Adolf Hitler, wasn't it? <laughs> but our family was, you know, the relocation experience began in 1942, just a couple of months after Pearl Harbor. And all the Japanese American, or Japanese, of Japanese ancestry, anybody of Japanese ancestry was taken to a relocation camp, anybody that lived on the West Coast. So we were living in Seattle, we meaning the Chihara family. I was the youngest of four children. I was born in 1938, so I was four years old when we were relocated, and we were there for three years. And those are my earliest memories, living in Minidoka, Idaho. There were 110,000 people relocated. There were 10,000 in our camp. Hmm. What is your earliest memory? What is the? What I is actually the... have a couple of memories before being interned okay. in Seattle, Washington, but they're very dim. But, uh, but uh, relocation camp itself is very vivid. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really became a performing artist there. I was only four to seven. But every Saturday we met, we meaning all the Japanese in our block, Block 14, met at a canteen, as it was called, it was a mess hall, you know. And uh, there were movies and entertainment and things, and I regularly sang, sang, sometimes with piano, sometimes with that. Um, I sang songs, and I used to be called Makasa, which is Japanese for MacArthur, you know, because they gave me this American hat, this uh, army cap. And I sang songs like, just imagine, Japanese American kid who's like five years old singing, my mama done told me when I was in knee pants, or I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar, all the songs of that era I knew. Did they have a piano there? Yeah. Uh -huh. And I, I, I know that I, I knew that I was bitten with the performing bug then. Everybody sees so cute and they applaud and then so forth. And shortly thereafter, as soon as we re relocated, my mother sent us to Catholic school in Spokane. See, we were not permitted to go back to Seattle, which was considered a militarily sensitive zone because of it was on the coast and Sandpoint Naval Base and Boeing Aircraft and Fort Lawton and Fort Lewis were there. So we went to Spokane, which is in the eastern part of the state. And there, with the nuns, I began my piano and violin lessons. So your, <laughs> your early experience in music was as a kid. You were a performer. That's you, right. You were, you were and shortly thereafter, in the Korean War, my sister Kathy and I, she's a pianist, we were part of a USO troop who entertained the troops. <laughs> so I've been a cornball performer my whole life. Being a professor is a new experience for me. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll get to that actually. I'm, right. I'm interested in your thoughts about that. Uh, yes. Because having only been a professor recently. You for know, three years. For, for three years. Yeah. Um, well, tell me then, tell me then why music about music's importance to you, but both both growing up and, mm -hmm. and how you know what it did for you growing up, kind of getting through these experiences, yeah. and then also why why is music important to you now? Well, time? first of all, I think that no matter what your experiences are, you're a musician or you're not from birth. I don't think that we choose that. Mm. It's just that my story is a little more dramatic or a little bit more like I was written by Charles Dickens, you know, mm -hmm. because of all of these ins and outs. But, but those are the accidents of history. What is not an accident was I was given that particular, you know, I have a very good ear. I have, like, for example, the songs that I heard in my childhood, including the movies, I remember those scores, the keys, the everything, 70 years later. And I haven't seen them on AME or Turner Classic Movies. And then when I do see them, it's exactly as I remembered them. That's a certain gift. And God gave me that gift. He didn't give me a lot of other gifts. Like, for example, I'm not tall, you know. <laughs> I'm good looking. But, I mean, I mean, there are many things that people have and take for granted that I've never had and always envied. But I always had that musical gift, and I always cherished it. From the very beginning, that gave me happiness. Did you ever doubt in that gift? Never. Never. I doubted, however, whether I would make it, you know, the, during those years of insecurity, which included all through the 60s, which were great in every other respect, you never knew whether you were going to make it. So I know what it is to have uh, doubts about career success, but I haven't any clue what it's like not to know what I want to do. Never. I mean, when I see people, especially students, who, who really are talented and smart, and you can see that they're torn because they're not clear where they want to go. Uh, I can understand what they're saying, but I can't relate to that emotionally because that's never, you know, it's like saying, 
I, I never want to eat or drink or something like that. I'm, you all my life, knew it was music. It had to be. It music. had to be music. That's yes. right. Now, of course, my parents were appalled at the thought that I might do that. Because <laughs> <laughs> in Japan, you know, to be an artist meant that you were either going to be a prostitute or a drug addict, you know. <laughs> well, I did one of the two, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I, I think that's very meaningful, actually, mm -hmm. especially for younger composers, younger musicians yeah. who have this sense, yeah. this is really what I need to do, mm -hmm. but you know, sometimes it feels like the world is conspiring against you. Yeah. And you sustained yourself through that period. Well, the world was conspiring against us. <laughs> See, I never had to be paranoid about that. I was true. <laughs> That's one good thing about being a persecuted minority. Uh -huh. if, when it's really clearly that, right. then you don't, you don't, no one can accuse you of being paranoid. That bad things happen. That actually frees you to some extent. Because in a way, when you're at the very bottom, the bottom can be viewed as a launching pad. I've always thought that. I've always thought that the difficult beginnings that my family endured was like a launching pad. So everything that happened to me, and many, many good things have happened to me, you know, including this job here. It's a terrific job. <laughs> you know, you know, you're one of my victim students. <laughs> you know, it's a fabulous job. You know, and and what musician can say he has a fabulous job right now in this day and age? Mm -hmm. right. So uh, there's something about. It reminds me of that song by. Um, um, Johnny Cash, you know, the boy, boy named Sue, about the guy who was named Sue and was always getting into fights, and later on in life he comes up against his dad, who's a ne'er-do-well, and says, why did you call me Sue? And he's because I knew if I gave you this name you'd grow up tough and survive. Mm -hmm. Well, there's something about that that I've always liked. Mm -hmm. I've always liked that kind of silly message, but... Uh, so you, <clears throat> you view both the hardship as a child and the mm -hmm. struggles later on in your early adult life mm -hmm. as a source of strength, really, for Yes, although to be honest, then and now I'm not sure it's strength. I think of myself as something more than a strong person. I think of myself as a survivalist. Mm. You know, I've had to do it through a combination of cunning and charm, you know, <laughs> like my favorite cats. Mm -hmm. You know, cats are not tigers, but they survive better than tigers. Mm -hmm. There are more cats in the world than tigers. Think about that. And is that because they're charming, Professor? Absolutely, charming? like me. <laughs>